All right, everybody, we're going to get started now. I think some people might still roll in as we begin. But this is the Climate and Health presentation with Citizens Climate Lobby. I'm with MUSC Sustainability. And just to give you a little background, we hold these every month, but we also do a lot around campus. We have initiatives in recycling and waste management, energy and water, food, transportation, climate, and green building. And if you want to hear more uh, about events like this, you can follow us on social media. We also have a green team email list sign up, which this is at the front, and we're on Yammer under broadcast. And with that, I'm going to bring up Catherine, and she's, gonna, she's with Citizens Climate Lobby. She's going to talk to us about climate and health. Thanks, Catherine. Thank you. Hi, guys. <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, so my name is Catherine Ampolini, and I'm actually a nurse anesthetist here at MUSC. I work over at Ashley River Tower. And um, you might be disappointed to hear that I'm not here to talk about anesthesia today, or maybe you're relieved about that. Um, but what I am here to talk to you today about is climate change and its effect on public health. And the reason I'm talking to you about that today instead of anesthesia is because I'm with this organization, the Citizens Climate Lobby. I'm a volunteer with them. I've been working with them for a couple of years. And just to give you a little background of why I got involved, um, I was watching a documentary in late 2017 called Chasing Coral. Not sure if any of you have seen it. It's an excellent documentary, really good. Um, they did a great job highlighting what's happening to the coral reefs around the globe right now. And it's really nothing short of devastating. Uh, it is an emotional movie, and at the end I was sitting there with tears in my eyes, and I was thinking about my nephew who was five at the time. And I was contemplating what this planet might look like when he reached my age, and I couldn't answer that question. And I think a lot of you can relate to that feeling when you start looking at statistics and you start learning more about global warming. It can feel uh, a little helpless, right? Like, what do we do from here? Um, but I was moved to action from that, and I went to their website because I wanted to get involved. And that ultimately led me to the CCL website, and I've been involved with them ever since. And um, we do a lot of great work. We had a big year last year, and uh, we're excited about this year. So at the end of the talk today, we'll talk a little bit more about um, the organization itself and what we're doing. Um, but initially, let's start our conversation today talking about climate change. So our story today kind of begins in 2009 when we talk about public health. And that was the year that the EPA issued a finding in the Federal Register stating that there were six directly emitted and well-mixed gases that constituted an endangerment to public health, those gases being carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and some others that I've grouped together here at the end. Now, when they said endangerment, they weren't talking about only the direct impact that you see on the planet itself, with sea levels rising, climate destabilization. They're talking also about the direct health to human beings, or the direct threat to human beings, being excess temperatures, increased allergens, increased disease vectors, and the particular impacts that vulnerable populations such as children and the elderly would suffer because of these things. So we know that increased greenhouse gas concentrations are what's directing climate change and global warming. And the reason that is is because they really prevent the heat that becomes trapped around underneath our atmosphere from going back out into space. Okay, So that's what's creating this global warming. And when we talk about that, we're mainly talking about carbon dioxide, which is responsible for over 75% of global warming. And it's not just the quantity of carbon dioxide that we're talking about, but the cumulative effect, because it stays in our atmosphere for centuries. So the first emissions that were coming from those steam engines making their way across the United States, those are still in our atmosphere today. And anything that we're emitting today is going to stay in our atmosphere. Methane also has a large uh, part in greenhouse gas formulation, but it only stays in the, decade, or the atmosphere for decades. So it's a little bit less of a contributor, but still a major component. Same thing with the HCF refrigerants and nitrous oxide stays in the atmosphere for about a decade or maybe several decades. And the last thing listed here is black carbon, which comes from diesel exhaust and from fires. And although it only stays in the atmosphere for weeks, it does settle on glaciers and promote melting. And it's interesting to note that in northern Tibet, uh, researchers recently linked some of the soot on the glaciers there to the Kuwait oil fires from the 90s. So you can see how that can have a great impact for many generations to come. So let's talk about some of the public health impacts that all of these things combine to create. So obviously we have increased air temperature. 
This is a problem for humans because we have a very narrow temperature range that we can function well in. So those people that make their livelihoods working outdoors will find it, become, it becomes increasingly dangerous to do so. Um, and then we have potentially lethal heat waves, which we're already seeing, but they're only going to increase in intensity and frequency. So if you think back to, say, 2005 in Karachi, Pakistan, there were about 4,000 people that lost their lives in Pakistan and in India directly related to heat waves and power outages. So there's, as these things increase and become more frequent, think about how many more lives will be affected. Sea level rise and flooding. Um, obviously, living here in Charleston, I think we're all really sensitive to this uh, because we see it often, right? We see flooding in the peninsula all the time. Um, so this creates a problem because the habitable land is reduced. There are many, many people that make their livelihoods along the coastal regions, and these people are directly impacted. In addition to that, we have intrusion of salt water into the aquifers, which affects our drinking water supply. Although the planet is made up of a lot of water, there's only a small amount that we can really use for drinking water unless we use other very tedious and expensive processes to change other types of water into drinking water. So additionally, on the flip side of that, we have increasing drought from high temperatures and spreading dry lands, which will only increase food shortages across the planet. Poor urban air quality. I spent many years living in Manhattan, and I can speak to the fact that the air quality up there is much different than it is in a place like Charleston, per se. Um, people that have asthma, it's exacerbated. It promotes more frequent upper respiratory infections. And there's more incidence of people being diagnosed with asthma and other respiratory illnesses. Now, not only do you have the direct effect on the lungs, but of course, this leads to other sequelae in cardiac illnesses and other disease processes. Ocean warming and acidification. Most of the, um, well, I shouldn't say most, but a significant portion of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is absorbed by the ocean itself. This not only increases the temperature of the ocean, but it decreases the pH and makes a more acidic environment. That makes it harder and harder for the organisms in the ocean, everything from algae to corals, fish, shellfish, everything in between, to function properly. It suppresses immune function, metabolism. It can make it more difficult for shellfish to create their shells because there's decreased carbonate in the ocean. In addition, these warm temperatures make it easier for toxic algae and cyanobacteria, viruses like Vibrio, um, to proliferate. And that can be a problem in coastal areas, but also in the inland areas. And then, uh, as the temperatures on the planet increase, we have an increased range of disease vectors. So pathogen formation increases with temperature rise, and insects like mosquitoes and ticks can proliferate with these warmer temperatures. So we see that there are a host of gastrointestinal and neurological diseases that can occur. Um, you can get infections through open skin directly, or it can be from the insects. And we've seen, you know, recently with Zika and malaria particularly, these can quickly become epidemic situations, especially in vulnerable populations. So in 2018, the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change released a report, which was a summary for policymakers. And what the IPCC is, it's a, a group of over 1,300 scientists that were tasked by the UN to summarize global warming and what policymakers can do to try to slow down and maybe possibly reverse some of the global warming. And their recommendation were that we are on a trajectory to have a global temperature rise to 2 degrees Celsius. And that's bad. But if we can make it 1.5 degrees Celsius, the impact of that would be greatly reduced for people. So that sounds like not a lot. A half a degree Celsius maybe doesn't sound like a lot to a lot of people. But as we go through the next slides, we'll talk about why that small increase in temperature could have such devastating effects from a social perspective, public health, and also economic. Um, if these uh, effects were to take place, it would affect the ability for governments to mitigate poverty, especially in developing countries. And although the temperature is already at one degrees Celsius, I do believe that we can slow this down. So let's talk a little bit about what would happen at a two degree Celsius temperature rise. And I have some pictures here on the next few slides that kind of demonstrate how this affects people on a global scale, but also us locally here in Charleston. So if we were to get to two degrees Celsius, sea level would rise to about 10 centimeters higher. Now, at 1.5 degrees Celsius, it's already going to be about 10 to 30 inches higher. So that's pretty significant. So even though 10 centimeters doesn't sound like a lot, it would affect about 10 million more people. So this picture here on the left is from Bangladesh. And there in Bangladesh, there's about 100 million people that live at sea level at the deltas. 
So think about that. Where would these people go? This would be a refugee crisis like the world has never seen before. And then on the right-hand side, if any of you have uh, taken your kayak to work, you can relate to this gentleman and his raft. Um, this is a local picture on the east side of Charleston. And there are some uh, studies that project that within three decades, there will be 8,000 homes in Charleston that will flood 26 times a year. That is just staggering. If you think about the social impact of that, the economic impact for the area, there would be a mass exodus. Um, it would be devastating for us. So at two degrees, the world seafood production would decline by an additional 1.5 million tons. So that doesn't just mean there's less tasty things for us to eat. It would affect entire livelihoods. And this picture here on the left is from Ghana. And it kind of um, shows you how people who are making their livelihood on the coastal regions would be completely devastated by this. Um, for some people, the only thing that they have to eat, the only thing they can make their livelihood on is the things that they can catch. So what happens when that disappears? And on the right-hand side, we have our oyster beds. Um, like we talked about, there's decreased carbonate when the um, water warms up and the pH decreases, and so these shellfish can't survive any longer. So they're already at risk at present day from these toxic algae blooms that we see, but soon they'll be affected by acidification. And we're already seeing that on the west coast with the oyster beds over there. The oysters are not thriving, so they're trying to plant more plants in the area to help um, increase the pH and help those oysters out. So urban life, like we talked about a little bit earlier, the air pollution it will be increasingly impacted. And this picture on the left is in China. And although it looks maybe like it's a foggy evening, that's actually smog. So that's particulates in the air. Anybody that already has asthma is obviously going to be exacerbated. More frequent respiratory infections are going to occur. The picture on the right is in Delhi. It's a man just trying to stay alive in 117 degree weather. And you can see when you look at these and think about vulnerable populations like the elderly, um, people that have comorbid diseases already, how they're at really great risk of being affected by this in large ways. And the other thing that I think we tend to forget about here um, in the US is the fact that cooling is a luxury. Not everybody has air conditioning. They don't have places they can go to get fresh cold water and cool down or go inside. So water shortages would also decrease by an additional 50% at 2 degrees Celsius. So already dry regions would become even more dry. And this is something, I spent time growing up in Florida, and it's something that I kind of always just thought was normal. But now I know it's not normal, and it's becoming more, uh, more of a problem. But you can't water your lawn more than once a week in most parts of Florida. The drinking water supplies are decreasing. And there's not really an end in sight for that. So people need to be a little bit more aggressive with that on a side note. Um, and then drought also causes more saltwater intrusion. So as the fresh water recedes, it allows the salt table to move in. And this picture here is from a forest not that far from Charleston, where the trees are being choked out by the salt water. So it degrades our ecosystems. It affects our municipal water drinking supply. And these pictures were from just last year, last summer. The picture on the left is a child looking at what's left of his family's livestock in Australia. This was all killed by the drought. And then the picture on the right is right here in our urban farm here at MUSC, where our crops were dying in the extreme heat. And even when I say extreme heat, it's nothing compared to some of the temperatures we were just discussing. So the waterborne diseases, the vectors, those things would increase. Um, this picture on the left is from Florida. This is an algae bloom that could potentially be carrying some of these diseases. And that's something you see in the coastal and the inland areas. I saw that a lot in Florida. Again, something that being a younger person I thought was just normal, you know, but it's not. Um, and so there are parts of Florida where you can't tell where the land ends and the water begins because everything is green like this. There's also increasing red tide. I don't know if anybody has experienced that here. Um, but in Florida, you can't even go to the beach when there's a big red tide occurring because all the toxins that are being released hurt your lungs pretty much immediately. Um, and then very sad on the right side of the page um, is this baby that was born with microcephaly. I'm sure a lot of you also remember the, um, all of the children that were affected by the Zika virus recently, and that is transmitted by mosquitoes that are able to proliferate in these warmer temperatures. Um, and of course, the effects of that will last the entire lifetime of this poor child and his family, and we're not sure exactly what those effects might be at this point. 
And I wanted to add this slide in also um, because of recent headlines because of the polar vortex last week. And so there were some comments going around about, you know, does this disprove climate change? We're so cold now, where is global warming? Kind of silly statements, but I did want to address it. Um, the polar vortex is nothing new. It's a band of strong winds that keeps those Arctic temperatures um, stabilized in that Arctic zone. And because of its increased incidence of coming down into the more populated areas like North America, there has been some research that's been spurred to figure out, does climate change have an effect on this? And it seems to be pointing in the direction of the changes in the wind patterns from climate change are what's allowing the polar vortex to descend more frequently. Um, so the jet streams over North America and Europe are slowing down. It's creating more undulations and patterns. And then um, because of the ice melting in the Arctic, it's melting at such a rapid pace, it creates this wider area of the dark ocean to absorb the heat in the summertime. And then in winter, it releases that heat back out and changes the wind patterns as well. So that's where the research is heading. There's not um, you know, clear definitive answers on that, but that's kind of what we're focusing on at this point. And so all of those things that we just talked about are not singular, they overlap, and they create a real threat to public health. This was a quote from the executive director of the American Public Health Association that was featured in the Washington Post, stating, we're committed to making sure the nation knows about the effects of climate change on health. If anyone doesn't think this is a severe problem, they are fooling themselves. So we've talked about all of the issues. Now let's talk a little bit about what people are doing about it. So the Paris Agreement is a first step. It is a baby step, um, but it is opening the dialogue and it's moving in the right direction. And contrary to what people might think, the United States is still involved in the Paris Agreement. It's to be revisited on five-year cycles, and we committed two years ago to be involved for five years. So we're still in it. Three years from now, that will be reevaluated. Um, there are five countries involved, the US, the EU, China, Brazil, and India. And you can, you can look through all the different benchmarks that each country has set on emissions. It gets a little vague, and you know, it can be, uh, the numbers can be skewed a little because um, the country that is utilizing the fossil fuel sometime isn't the country that's taking the burden of it. So I don't want to delve too deep into that, but I just want to say that this is a step in the right direction. Um, in addition to reducing their own carbon emissions, there would be money set aside for developing nations to adapt and to develop their own clean energy sources. And another note on this is the U.S. is actually leading the way on clean energy, despite how we might be represented as a country in some of the global discussions on climate change, we are leading the way. Um, there, for example, in Texas, 17% of all their power comes from wind sources right now. In Hawaii, there are entire towns that are powered by battery and solar. So we are making great strides. So this graph is in the IPCC report, and it's a little bit busy, but I'm going to walk you through it. And the idea behind this graph is that um, by the year 2055, we really need to be at net zero fossil fuel emissions to achieve this goal of 1.5 degrees Celsius warming. And in addition to that, we have to reduce the non-CO2 greenhouse gas emissions by 40% by the year 2100. So if you look on the left side of the graph in that orange plume, this is you know, from 1960 up to present day. And although there is some uncertainty, you can see those graph points are kind of vacillating up and down because it is hard to measure the entire temperature on the planet. Um, you can see the trajectory is obviously there, right? We've been increasing global temperatures at an alarming rate. Now, the orange horizontal line up here is the 1.5 degrees Celsius. <coughs> and as you get past the present day and you go into those other three different colored plumes, there's still some uncertainty, and there's probably even a greater degree of uncertainty. But the gray plume is what I'd like you to focus on, and that's the one kind of in the center. That would be getting us to zero emissions by the year 2055 and decreasing those non-CO2 emissions that we just talked about. The blue plume is even better. We're at net zero emissions by the year 2040, and that's great. That really increases our odds of being below or at 1.5 degrees. Probably not as feasible as the gray plume. The purple plume, we hope to avoid. That's the one where we still are at net zero fossil fuel emissions by 2055, but we haven't reduced the non-CO2 emissions. Okay. So can this be done? 
We think so. Uh, it does sound daunting, unprecedented even, but the technology is already here. We need incentivization for people. We need political backing for it. And if you think about your own personal lifetime, uh, for me personally growing up, we had nothing like the internet. I couldn't ask Google all of my burning questions at any hour of the day. I had to look things up in an encyclopedia. I didn't have a phone that would sync all my calendars and tell me when my next appointment was. I had to write it down. And these are all small things, right? But that's my lifetime. Think about back before we had electricity. Now every house, every room is wired for electricity. We have highway systems where we used to have horse-drawn carriages. Once the technology arrives, it can take off quickly. So yes, we do think this can be done. And these pictures here highlight some of the benefits that we have of contributing money to developing nations. They can completely bypass our evolutionary path as far as energy is concerned. This man here in India is tending to his solar panels. And they have a very aggressive goal to have 100 gigawatts of solar power installed by the year 2022, and they're right on track with it. So it's very promising. And we have more good news. Late last year, the House introduced a bill called the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. And it had bipartisan sponsorship, which is important if you think about long term. Because with each change of administration, things can be overturned, undone. But if you have bipartisan sponsorship of something, you're kind of ensuring it for the future. What this uh, bill proposes is that there would be a tax on the carbon content of fossil fuels. It would be levied at the point of extraction, which would be the mine, the well, the port. And it would begin at $15 per ton of carbon equivalent per year. Or, I'm sorry, $15 per ton. And it would increase by $10 per ton, which is a predictable and stable rise every year after that. All of that revenue would not be collected as a tax and go to the government for its use it would be distributed back to the American taxpayer as a dividend system. <coughs> the tax on the energy carbon content equivalent from any other country that doesn't have a similar tax or cap uh, would be adjusted at the border. So there would be a tariff adjustment at our border. Now, why is this a good thing? Why do we want this? It sounds like more taxes. It sounds bad, right? Uh, but what it does is it reflects the true social cost of burning fossil fuels. So it would end the era of people being able to emit um, emissions into the atmosphere for free. It, the, it creates a social cost for everyone else on the planet when these corporations or these people that are burning the fossil fuels are not held accountable for it. It provides an incentive for large energy users. So it would send a clear market signal to people and incentivize different forms of energy, clean energy, more energy efficient practices. And larger companies like utility industries, um, property companies, would be more motivated to seek those things out. The return dividend would also offset the cost to the lower and middle income families. I think that's a concern a lot of people have when they hear about this is, well, how is this going to affect me? Obviously, prices are going to go up. Gas is going to go up. Utilities are going to go up. And yes, it will, but it will be marginal for the consumer. Gasoline would go up about 10 cents a gallon. Uh, there might be a slight increase in your utility bills. But economic models show that two-thirds of all households would either break even or come out ahead with this uh, dividend. And at the highest point of it, each household would be bringing in several hundred extra dollars a month. So it's pretty substantial. There would be a 40% reduction in emissions from the years 2015 to 2025, which would be more than meeting our US Paris Agreement. And if you think back to that graph, that might get us a little bit closer to that blue plume that we looked at. And there would be an increase in economic growth. It's projected that 2.1 million jobs would be created in the first decade alone. And I'd like to add, too, we just talked about all these effects on public health, and it wasn't on that slide. But it's also projected that about 295,000 lives would be saved. So that's probably the most important thing. I should, probably should have had that on that slide, actually. <laughs> um, so Citizens Climate Lobby, which is that organization that I told you about in the beginning that I'm working with, actually created this legislation. It's a large group of people um, that are concerned citizens that have banded together with econ economists and scientists and discussed options and solutions. And we came up with this. And we've been lobbying very hard to get it introduced. Now that it has been introduced, we're going to be working even harder to make sure it actually gets passed. So we have about 60,000 volunteers spanning across the globe over 30 different countries. And we have over 400 chapters. 
Um, we meet twice a year in DC and have our big lobbying events. And we also do a lot of stuff here locally. Obviously, I'm here today talking to you guys. Um, we do table events. We have internships with our local university and college here. Um, and our answer to all of these problems is democracy. So obviously, we can all do our own part um, to decrease our own carbon footprint. But for something as aggressive as what the IPCC recommends, we really need government backing and government action. And so that's why we want to make our voices heard and tell governments what we want and what the solutions are. And it's not just us who've come up with the solution. If you look into it, there are many organizations and experts that have agreed that a carbon fee and dividend is the best solution for global warming. And here are some of the things that we've accomplished, over 65,000 letters to Congress, over 10,000 letters to the editor, um, over 5,000 congressional meetings, over 1,000 op-eds published. Um, on a side note, Mark Gold is our chapter director here in Charleston. He was supposed to be here with me today. He's an environmental engineer and complete expert on all these things. I was very nervous to come in and talk to you alone today. Um, but he's not here because he's accepting an award from the Post and Courier for an op-ed that he wrote. So, um, And we have over 500, close to 600 endorsements for climate action um, acquired already. And we invite you to help us out. If you'd like to, help us build political will to create this greener and healthier world for everybody. And these are some of the things that you might uh, want to get involved in. These are some of the things that we do. We talk to our elected officials. We reach out to people locally, create awareness, writing letters, using your social media accounts, um, and helping with your outreach and internships at colleges. We have a bunch of interns from the College of Charleston and um, also from MUSC that work with us too. So, and of course, bringing your own ideas and energy. After looking at all of that, um, it does seem daunting. And in order to make these huge global changes, it's going to take a lot of collaboration and a lot of ideas. And the more that we band together as humans, I think we can really do this. So here's some contact information. You can look at our website. You can email us. Um, we have a sign-up sheet in the front of the room, too, for you guys. If you're interested in just finding out more about us and getting updates and newsletters, you can put your email. And if you'd like to actually get involved, please leave your phone number. We'll contact you directly and let you know how you can join in. So thank you guys so much. And I'll open it up to questions now. Thank you.